Nowadays, when we're building out data centers, one of the biggest, I guess I would call it a buzz term, would be something called multi-tenancy, and it comes up a lot. Because a lot of the time, when we're building out data centers, and we have all of these resources, all that rack space, that networking infrastructure in that data center, we're not using it all for our own resources. Take something like a public cloud provider. If you have a data center for an Azure, or AWS, or a GCP, those data centers are not going to be dedicated to just running a Microsoft resource or an Amazon resource. You have other customers coming in and using their data centers, using that public cloud platform to build out their own resources, their own services. And when we have all of these different customers with different resources and security requirements and policies that are all sharing this one common set of data center infrastructure, well, there's a lot of extra considerations that have to go into designing the infrastructure and building that data center out. And so in this video, what I want to do is just explore some of the basic motivations that we have for multi-tenancy, like why are we running these multi-tenant data centers in the first place? and then take a look at some of the capabilities that we have when we talk about securing multi-tenant data centers. Let's go. So to really understand all of the considerations behind a multi-tenant data center, all we really have to do is think of that data center like this apartment building right here. Now, let's brainstorm for a moment here and think about all of the things that are private between this tenant right here and this tenant and this tenant right here. So the private things that we have, well, they all have their private rooms, right? So we don't want other people to just be able to waltz into other people's rooms. We want them to have some privacy. So we have locks on the front doors so that only the tenant with the key can get in. Okay, so we have rooms. And then we also have private belongings. So if you have your thousand, I can actually spell the word belonging here, geez. So if you have your PC in your room right there, you also want to just be able to traipse in and grab it. It sort of ties in to the idea of a private room, but this is different here because we're talking about the actual items in those rooms. So private rooms, private belongings. What else? Well, I mean, honestly, not all that much else is private in an apartment building. You have your space, you have your items, but beyond that, maybe you can think some other things there, but they'd be pretty minor there at best. Now, there are a lot more things to talk about when we talk about what is shared. Okay, well, we have shared water lines. So you don't have a terminate water line that's private to your apartment. You get one hot water line, one cold water line there, and everyone in the apartment shares that water line. We also include sewage while we're here, but I don't really want to talk about that for obvious reasons. And then we have private electricity. So let's expand on this point here a little bit. So for example, you have those shared main lines that are coming into the entire building that are providing power to everyone there. But there are some things that are private about this electricity. For example, if some guy here plugs in like a mega hairdryer or something else that'll blow a breaker, well, you don't want this guy here to blow the breakers of all of everyone else here, right? You want this person's breakers to be private. So we have some privacy here, our breakers, but our main lines are still being shared. So my point here in breaking all of this down here is that we want enough things to be private here, our rooms, our belongings, things like our breaker, so that we don't have these tenants here interfering with the security and honestly the peace of other tenants here, but we want to have enough that's shared that there's actually an efficiency advantage here. Why do people live in apartments? Well, people live in apartments because usually they're more affordable than buying land and building up a house or buying up a house. And a lot of the cost savings is passed on through because we have all of this shared infrastructure here. So how do we take that concept that we just saw there with the apartment complex and move it over here to this data center that we're looking at? So let's say that this is a co-location facility here. Now, for those of you who are not familiar with the term, we just usually call it a colo there. This is basically, it's a really simple concept. It's a data center for rent. So you have a company that builds up a data center, but the bulk of that data center is rented out to customers. And those customers bring in their own servers, their own storage, their own data, all of that. But the advantage to actually doing a co-location approach instead of just running your own data center if you're a customer, well, you don't have to pay 
for the racks. You don't have to pay for the electricity. You don't have to pay for the cooling. All you have to do is pay for the hardware that you're bringing in that you're running that you would have had to have bought anyway if you were to build up your own data center. Except you get to pay a relatively low price to this colo provider for them to do all the work of building up the actual data center facilities and for you to just be able to put in your servers and just get to work building out your infrastructure. So we've just established then what's private about a co-location facility. And these types of facilities, our servers are private, our data is private, and our resources, that sort of ties into data there, all of these things are all private. And so your expectation as a customer of a colo facility, look, your, your server might literally in the rack be touching another company's servers, but your expectation is that that other company has zero access to your resources because they may be in a shared facility, but those resources are still yours. So then what here would be shared infrastructure? Well, shared infrastructure would be things like your facilities. So like I mentioned earlier, electricity, cooling, land, all of those things, all of those are costs of the co-location provider. So they're the ones paying it and everyone shares a common set of facilities. And then we also have things like the internet link. So as you can see above here, we have this one common internet connection for the entire facility and we have some routers, some switches that everyone shares and everyone plugs into. And this is where a lot of customers can sometimes get pretty concerned, rightfully so. Because if you have customer A servers right here and it's connected to this switch, well, what's stopping them from using that same switch to go to, let's say this is company B server right here, so B, what's stopping them from using this switch to go out this link and hit that company servers. And that concern is really where the idea of traffic isolation comes into full force. Because if you have customer A right here, well, you want to make sure that all of their traffic is kept separate from all the other customers. That way, because it's a two-way thing, that way the other customers can't read in to see what customer A is sending. And on top of that, the other customers cannot be affected or cannot be reached by customer A. And so why isolate traffic? Well, it all comes back around to security, as you can see by this handy dandy little lock here. And we just touched on the first security related reason for isolating traffic, making sure that we can create these segmented customer environments. And because we can do this, one of the other things that we gain as a benefit here is the ability to protect other customers from threats. So if one customer's servers, for example, get infected with some sort of malware, and that malware is now going out, it's a worm, it's searching the network for other hosts to infect, well, if you have your customer environments very heavily segmented off from each other, that threat, sure, we don't want any customer to be affected by threats, but like, if you have a threat, let's contain it inside of that customer environment. And that's what creating these segmented environments allows us to do. And then the other big benefit that we have here with traffic isolation that we're going to get into is the control that it gives you over policy. So if you're a co-location provider, you might, you will actually have customers come in that have different security requirements, different policies from each other. So let's say you have a healthcare provider come in and want to store their infrastructure in your facility. Well, if they're storing patient health data there, well, they're going to be subject to the requirements, at least in the U.S., of HIPAA. And HIPAA has a lot of requirements for how you store that data, for how you transit that data across the network. So what you can do is you can design a policy just for them that helps them to comply with HIPAA while also keeping off your other customers free from those constraints because they're not storing patient health data. They don't need to comply with HIPAA. And likewise, if you have, let's say, a customer come in that has contracts with the government, well, that customer can get another policy that's targeted specifically towards them. And again, all of the other customers that you have that are not subject to the same requirements, well, they can have their own policy. So being able to be so granular with how you apply these policies, because you're separating out the traffic, you're isolating these devices and you're isolating their traffic, 
That is one of the other big benefits of traffic isolation. So traffic isolation is this amazing tool that we have to help keep customers safe in a multi-tenant data center where we do have all of the shared infrastructure here. And traffic isolation specifically is going to be our focus all throughout the rest of the series. So on that note, in the next video, we're going to go ahead and get into something called private VLANs that can help us with this. Because throughout this entire video, you may have been thinking, well, wait, couldn't you just put all of these customers into their own VLAN and that would solve all of the problems that you're talking about? Well, yeah, for the most part. But there are some extra design considerations with VLANs that private VLANs can help us with. So that's the bit we're going to go ahead and get into again in the next video. So I'll catch you over there. In the meantime, I hope this is informative for you. I'd like to thank you for viewing.